Uh, following are the intimations for today and for this week. Um, welcome to all who have joined us for worship today, uh, online or present here in the service. Evening service, 6.30 in Inver, and via, also via Facebook and Zoom. Services next Lord's Day, 12 noon, 6.30 p.m., both in Port Mahomach, and the preacher expected is Reverend John McPherson. Sabbath school next week, 11.15 in the church vestry, and the midweek meeting, Wednesday, 7.30 via Zoom. These are the intimations, and they are, of course, subject to the will of the Lord. Now let us lift up our voices and hearts to the Lord, singing to his praise in Psalm 147. Psalm 147, and from the beginning down to verse 5. Psalm 147, from the beginning. Praise ye the Lord, for it is good. Praise to our God to sing. For it is pleasant, and to praise it is a comely thing. God doth build up Jerusalem, and he it is alone that the dispersed of Israel doth gather into one. Those that are broken in their heart and grieved in their minds he healeth, and their painful wounds he tenderly outbinds. He counts the number of the stars, he names them every one. Great is our Lord, and of great power his wisdom search can none. These verses from Psalm 147, Praise ye the Lord, for it is good praise to our God to sing. Before the Lord in prayer, let us pray. Gracious, merciful, and most blessed God, our Father in heaven, help us to draw near to thee with due reverence and godly fear this afternoon. Give us grace in our hearts that we may understand what we are doing as we come to worship thee, thou who art the living and true God, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. Thou art sovereign, thou dost count the number of the stars and name them every one. 
for thou art omniscient, thou art omnipresent, and thou art omnipotent. Thou art the Lord God who reigneth, and we pray that we might be, cu- be, able to, be enabled to come to thee with humbled hearts today, with a desire to praise and magnify thy name, especially for thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who took our flesh to his divine nature and lived in this world in order to, to be a sacrifice once offered for sin forever. We thank thee for the Lord Jesus Christ, for all that he is in himself, the God-man redeemer, the saviour, two natures in one person forever, the one who died upon the cross to reconcile a people to himself, to thyself. And we pray that we may come to thee ever through him, the glorious redeemer of God's people, the one who is risen from the dead, ascended to thy right hand, and who is living to intercede for his own. We thank thee, Lord, that we have a mediator between us and thyself, the God-man, and we pray that thou wouldst help us to look and wait for his coming, to have that concern to glorify and honour him who is coming again, coming again to judge the world in righteousness. And we pray, Lord, that we would ever be ready for that day we may must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Graciously bless us then as a gathering here this day. Bless everyone gathered and all the families represented and all the children present. Grant, Lord, thy blessing and presence with us, that that thy name would be honoured and that we would be benefited and blessed under the hearing of thy word as it is sung, as it is read, and its meditation upon it. Gracious Lord, grant thy blessing then upon us and all the Israel of God today, gathered to praise and magnify thy name. Lord, we pray that there might be encouragement in the assemblies and gatherings of thy people everywhere, that they may recognize themselves to be before thee who are to, who, for whom nothing is impossible, and so to take courage and to seek the advance of thy kingdom consequently. Give us a spirit of prayer and praise and of worship. Take away all that is a hindrance to receiving thy blessing. Grant, O Lord, to save the unsaved and to sanctify thine own. Forgive us all our sin and draw near to us in grace. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Let us sing once again to the praise of the Lord, this time in Psalm 125. Psalm 125. And we'll sing the whole psalm to the praise of the Lord. They in the Lord that firmly trust shall be like Zion Hill, which at no time can be removed, but standeth ever still. As round about Jerusalem the mountains stand alway, the Lord his folk doth compass so from henceforth and for aye. Singing the whole psalm, Psalm 125. They in the Lord that firmly trust shall be like Zion Hill.
Let us read in the scriptures of the Old Testament in the book of the prophet Daniel. Book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, besieging it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. <coughs> now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshech, and to Azariah of Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are in your sort, of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them drink. Then let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days... Their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Amen, and may the Lord add his blessing to this reading from his holy word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Now let us sing to the Lord once again, and this time in a portion of Psalm 119, Psalm 119 from verse 73 to verse 80. Psalm 119 from verse 73 it is the 10th part of Psalm 119, 
Thou madest and fashionedst me thy laws to know, give wisdom, Lord. So who thee fear shall joy to see me trusting in thy word. That very right thy judgments are, I know and do confess. And that thou hast afflicted me in truth and faithfulness. O let thy kindness merciful, I pray thee, comfort me. As to thy servant faithfully was promised by thee. And so on. Down to verse 80. Psalm 119 from verse 73. Thou madest and fashionedst me thy laws to know. Give wisdom, Lord. Let us once again come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. <coughs> Gracious and most merciful God, our Father in heaven, help us to draw near to thee with a sense of our dependence upon thee, dependence upon the work of thy Holy Spirit. But help us to come with penitent hearts, sorrowful for our sin, for our unworthiness, but thankful for a, for a Saviour 
and for the remedy that there is for sin and sinners in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for thy blessing upon us here gathered this afternoon. We pray for all the families here, for all the children present. We pray that thou wouldst deal graciously and lovingly with each one of us, and that thou wouldst grant thou who knowest our hearts and knowest our souls, that thou wouldst deal graciously with us, savingly with those who are unsaved, and in a way of sanctification with those who are thine own. Grant, Lord, that we might come as those who are captives to thy word, who have a desire to learn of it, and to keep it, and to live by it. O oh, Lord our God, to this end, we pray for the work of thy Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would come in great power upon us, and that we might be spiritually minded people and might know the, the work of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. So graciously bless us here as a, as a gathering of individuals and families. And we pray for this congregation. We pray, gracious Lord, that at this time of vacancy they might no, nevertheless know the blessing of Jesus among them. He who walks among their lampstands and is, and is ready to bless and we pray, Lord, for faithfulness in the preaching of the word from this pulpit and from all the pulpits of our church. And indeed, we pray that this would increase, that throughout the length and breadth of our land, there might be faithfulness to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in the, the, the pulpits and in the congregations and churches of our land, that there will be a recovery of biblical faith and life and orthodoxy, and that the blessing of God would attend thy word as, as in days past, with times of revival, with times of gospel blessing and quickening. So bless this congregation. Grant guidance to it in th that which falls to it in these days. Grant wisdom upon those who are office bearers appointed in the congregation. The intermoderator, we commend them to thee. And we pray that thou wast add to their number. Grant encouragement in, this, in these days. Encouragement through the preaching of the word and encouragement in the fellowshipping of the people. Graciously bless us, then, we pray thee today. We do pray for our denomination, that thou wouldst visit us with times of reviving and quickening, that thy blessing would be upon all our congregations and all our ministers, all our ministries, our office bearers, and our members and adherents. We pray, gracious Lord, not least for those congregations which are vacant at this time, and we pray, we pray that thy blessing would be upon them, Lord, that they, they might be guided. They may be guided in, in uh, the matter of the settlement in a congregation of a man of thine own choosing. And we pray that thou wouldst to this end raise up men for the ministry in our church. In, and grant, Lord, that we might see men raised up for the eldership as well in our congregations. O oh Lord our God, these are great blessings, and we pray that thou wouldst draw near to us and grant that we might uh, enjoy these blessings in our church in these days. But also in spreading thy word and taking the gospel to the highways and byways and encouraging, pressing people to come in under the hearing of thy word. Gracious Lord, we pray for, for our land as a whole not only our own branch of the church, but other branches of the church where the gospel is found. Grant, Lord, that it may be fruitful and that there may be blessing. But we do pray for thy blessing upon our own work at home and overseas. We think of our home mission worker, Donald John Morrison, and pray for his itinerant work, that it would be blessed of thee, even though there may not be, there may not be apparent uh, results from it. Yet, Lord, we thank thee that thou knowest these things, and eternity itself will tell what good work has been done for souls through that itinerant work that he undertakes. We pray also for our foreign field. We pray for our dear brother Parthapan in Sri Lanka and commend him and his work to thee. Our brethren in the, the United States Presbytery also, and we thank thee for the growth of the congregations there and for the church there and pray for, for, for them that, Lord our God, the preaching stations that have been initiated might, be, might blossom, and that thou thyself would be amongst them to bless them. We pray for our brethren in Po and in Barcelona, for the emerging congregation also in 
Portugal. We commend these to thyself, Lord, and pray that there might be great encouragement. And we pray for the work of the gospel among the Jews. We commend this to thyself, Lord, and pray that they might come to recognize and acknowledge Christ as the Messiah, Christ as the King, Christ as the one who was the promised Savior and Deliverer, and that receiving him, this might, be, might, might give a life from the dead for the, for, for the Gentile churches. Gracious Lord, we pray for work of the gospel also among Muslims. We pray for Middle East Reform Fellowship and for the transmission of, of services and teaching into Muslim lands. And to ask, Lord, that many would be delivered uh, from that false religion and come to re receive the only true Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, through whom no one can come to the Father but by him. Gracious Lord, we pray for thy blessing upon our nation. We pray for our new king and for his family, for the royal family, and commend them to thee. We pray for a work of grace among them, Lord, that they may become an example of those who fear the Lord. We pray for thy blessing upon them that they might submit to the king of kings, indeed, and would acknowledge him as their king and ruler. Gracious Lord, we pray for our government as well, for the new prime minister and for the cabinet and, and the government. We commend this to thyself that they might have a concern for righteousness. We are grieved, Lord, at the offence to thy law of so much legislation of late. And Lord God, thou knowest how oppressive it makes us feel, and yet not half as much as it ought, no doubt. But we pray, Lord, that thou wouldst visit us with times of such blessing that we would see a government over us who would have a concern for, for, for righteousness, which exalts a nation, that righteousness by thy measure of righteousness. And we pray, Lord, that there would be blessing for our nation accordingly. We pray, Lord, now for those who are laid aside through illnesses and infirmities, and we commend them to thyself and pray for thy blessing upon them where they are. We pray for those listening in to the service today also, those who are housebound, we commend them to thyself and pray that there may be blessing even by this medium. Gracious Lord, grant this, we pray thee, and continue with us as we open thy word. Grant, Lord, that it would strike a chord in our souls and that it would produce a greater desire for conformity to Christ and to his word, that we would reflect the person of Christ, that we would show forth Christ that we might be filled with his spirit and blessed under the hearing of his word. And so, Lord, bless us this afternoon. Open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of thy law. Keep us from all that is of sin and error. Forgive us and receive us graciously and help us to live and to walk by faith and not by sight. We ask in Jesus' name and for his precious sake. Amen. Will you turn with me, please, to the passage which we read in, the, in Daniel chapter 1? Daniel chapter 1. I'd like particularly to reflect on the first eight verses this, uh, this afternoon of Daniel chapter 1. And there's a sense in which these verses set the scene for us of what uh, uh, unfolds in this book of Daniel. So let me, just, uh, let me just invite you to put yourself in the position of these young men taken by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians into the land of Shinar. How would you feel? Indeed, how would you fare in that foreign land? Why were they there? Why were they there at all? Well, they'd been taken captivity, into captivity by the enemy. So what advice do you give them? Would you say, well, some feeble souls might say, don't make things difficult for yourself. Go along with the culture of the land. Swallow your pride. Don't make such a big thing out of your religion. Tone it down. 
tone it down, make it acceptable and bright and lively. But why did the captivity happen? Was it not apostasy among the professed people of God? Their lack of faithfulness to the word and will of Jehovah? Wasn't that why there was a captivity in the first place? Now, of course, the captivity was without respect of persons, in that some truly God-feeling souls were caught up, it, were caught up in, the de, in, in the debacle and found themselves far from home. Like Daniel and his friends, very much in a minority, seeking to live by the standards and word and law of their God, indeed the only living and true God, to whom they were answerable and felt themselves answerable. But this was a judgment on Judah, the southern kingdom. Yes, they had to make the best of it, but did that inevitably involve compromise with the principles of their faith, the faith once delivered to the saints, the faith revealed to them by the God of heaven? Did they have to compromise it? Well, we have answers, some answers to that question in the book of Daniel. Indeed, throughout the book of Daniel. And it raises questions. Is this relevant for us today? And we can't help but feel when we come into the book of Daniel that we're coming into familiar territory. The familiar territory is being in captivity. Being in captivity. It's interesting that at the outset of the Reformation, Martin Luther, the reformer, described the church as having been in a Babylonian captivity. And how did it arise? Can we see this in our own day? The church is in a sort of Babylonian captivity. Arising, how, why? Want of faithfulness. Faithfulness to what? To who? To the kingship and to the lordship of the divine person of the Lord Jesus Christ. A failure to submit to the authority of the word of God. And we can say that this is true of our own day. The church as a whole, or in general, finds itself paralyzed, paralyzed under a perverse, secular, godless sort of juggernaut of a society in which essentially fist is sh their fist is shaken at in the face of God, in the face of the eternal and only begotten Son of God, people shake their fists at him these days with apparent impunity. And yet, what hope is there in this present secular environment in which we find ourselves these days? There is no hope, realistic and final hope, in the secular society, in secular government, unless it bows the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and suddenly encourages us to be repentant before God and to humble ourselves before him. There is no hope either in the pressure groups spreading perversities in gender or sex or marriage. There's no hope even through any church which abandons the supreme authority of the word of God and the supreme lordship of Jesus Christ in his church. There is no hope, in other words, for any church even which abandons the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, become detached from it and its demands. Yet there is hope. There is hope. Even in a desperate situation, and this is one of the lessons of the book of Daniel. There is hope in repentance. There is hope in Christ and through the work of the Holy Spirit. After all, the gates of hell cannot finally hinder the building of Christ's church. And this is something that is exemplified here in Daniel chapter 1. At the very least, Daniel and his friends are, are, are challenging us 
in what way they are challenging us to live faithful lives in a spiritual and morally dysfunctional society. And that's what it was then. And that's what ours is nowadays. What we have here at the outset of this book refers to the first invasion of Judah by Nebuchadnezzar around 605 BC. Around then. Nebuchadnezzar had come against Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, in that year. And it was the third year of Je Jehoiakim's reign. And after he, had after he had defeated the Assyrian and Egyptian coalition at Carchemish, which is in modern northern Syria on the border with Turkey. Judah, Judah was finally conquered in 586 BC, and many were taken into captivity at that point. But here's a couple of important points that arise from this. The first is in verse 2. The Lord gave Jehoiakim into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. In other words, what seemed just a random disaster from one point of view was indeed something judicial. It's a judicial act. This had arisen, this captivity had arisen by God's overseeing of this situation. In other words, we are reminded of this. The Lord did not lose control of the situation there in affecting Judah. He gave them over to this captivity at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. It's very much like the Apostle's argument, the Apostle Paul's argument in Romans chapter 1, isn't it? Paul speaks of those who fail to give God the glory in this world, despite evidences of his, of his creative power and Godhead. The Lord gives them over to what? He says, he says to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts and wild passions, he says, such as homosexual activity. And he adds this, Paul does, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, by which we, we may take it that he means eternal death. That is a very solemn thought, isn't it? It's a solemn thought. A part, of course, a part, of course, from repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Godhead is not, however, impotently standing by in this or any other situation. What people sow, they will reap, whether it be Judah or whether it be ultimately Babylonia. And we read right at the end of this, this chapter, verse 21, how, how eventually Babylon would be overtaken by Persia under Cyrus. So the kingdoms of this world come and go according to the purpose of the sovereign God with whom we have to do. The second point here is this, that between the third year of Jehoiakim and chapter 10, verse 1, the third year of Cyrus, of which we read in verse 21 here, there are about 70 years now, assuming Daniel to be in his teens here, perhaps his high teens, maybe mid-teens, assuming that, well, uh, when we get to chapter 10, Daniel is in his uh, 80s at least, at least in his 80s. And what's the significance of that? Well, here's a lesson from the whole story of Daniel. Consistent faithfulness throughout a long life notwithstanding the captivity in a godless society. And that's a challenging thought for those of you who are older, and it's a challenging thought for those who are younger as well. Whatever the span of our lives may be, the first priority for us is to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, to repent of our sins and receive him as Savior and Lord. That is the first priority. And then the next priority is to persevere in it 
to the end. He who endures to the end will be saved. And the final fruit of being a Christian, whoever professes to be a Christian, is the fruit of perseverance, the perseverance of the saints. And this is clearly something that's reflected here in the experience of Daniel from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, when he was probably in his 90s, in his teens at the beginning and his 90s at the end, and he perseveres in, in his faith in the Lord. So the Babylonians, at least in this first chapter, we read of them taking the material treasures from Jerusalem to Babylon, and they took, furthermore, the cream of their youth. They'd essentially be slaves. They would be prepared for, pagan, for, for, for life in this pagan, for service in this pagan society by the learning and language of the Chaldeans on the one hand, and they would submit to the dietary laws in a three-year training. We read in verse 5, this is the sort of thing that was set out for them. And finally, they were given Chaldean names. Verses 6 and 7. Now, I suggest to you this is all very subtle and intended to loosen the attachment of these captives, to loosen their attachment to their history, basically. You can see this happening in our society, loosening attachment to our history, rewriting it, not least in our beloved Scotland, it has to be said. But history forgotten, a good history, a godly history forgotten, spells spiritual blight. This is why we should be aware of our history, and particularly our godly history, reading concerning the revivals, the reformation and revivals that have taken place, leading and learning about the disruption from which the free church emerged as a strong evangelical force in 1843 and around then. You see, the conquering of people militarily or by force is one thing. Far more subtle and dangerous is losing heart and mind and will by a process of re-education, something that, for example, the LGBT organizations, secular media have been masters at masters at informing people's minds and hearts so that they utterly compromise to it, even to the extent of churches accepting it however let's see the lessons we can learn from a situation confronting these faithful young men in this chapter notice first of all the isolation endured the isolation endured why take these men back to Babylon at all? Well, the answer is isolation. They will be isolated from their history and from their religious culture. Submitted to us, they, submit, they will be submitted to a subtle brainwashing under the influence of the prevailing culture, under the sway of the evil one. Here were young men brought up with the law of God, with public and private worship, brought up with the word of the Lord, brought up with a concern to be faithful to the Lord. But the evil one wants to separate people from religious habits or traditions and religious texts as well, the Bible and its message. In our society, we have had this sort of order going on. If the truth of the Bible can be questioned and att attachment to the Bible can be undermined, very soon, Bible doctrine will be largely forgotten. And in a consequence, in the process of time, biblical morality will be displaced in people's lives. Lo and behold, the church becomes gradually, gradually, morally and doctrinally bankrupt. That's a strategy of the evil one. To which in history, as in Judah then, churches have declined and fallen. The moral t tone of a nation will depend upon the moral tone and strength of the church within the nation. Because as men and women come under the hearing of the word and are responsive to it, 
and that begin to apply it in life and the moral principles and the doctrinal realities of it, the doctrinal truths of which they become convinced, then this will filter through into the nation. And rather than the world and the flesh and the devil prevailing, it will be the truth of God will be like a, a salt and light in society. So if a governing body and a media are under the sway of the evil one, then it will take courage steadfastly to believe, for example, in the exclusive claims of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the supreme authority of the word of God, in the headship of Jesus Christ over the nation, over King Charles III and over, and over the conservative government as well. The exclusive claims of King Jesus in these areas as well ought to be acknowledged. Think of the influences in our society. Stores and garden centres open on a Sunday. Sports schedule for Sundays. Access to all sorts of television, online entertainments. And not only so, pronouncements and legislation of governments which are offensive to the word and law of God. My dear friends, how easy it is to become secularized. We become secularized. It takes courage to think independently in spiritual and moral things. It takes devotion. It takes carefulness and diligence and prayerfulness and devotion to Christ and to his word. Detach people from a biblical worldview then. Public worship and the church and the devil clap their hands. When people are, when people are detached from, from, from a biblical worldview and public worship, the devil claps his hands. He is happy when people become lifeless and nominal in their faith, as was the case we know in Revelation 2 and 3. Revelation 3, particularly, in the cases of Sardis, the dead church. God forbid that we should become a dead church. And the Laodicean church, which was compromised, lukewarm. God forbid that we should become a lukewarm church or a Sardis-like church. But in this transformation of these attempted trans tra transformation of these men there is this secondly the indoctrination that is enforced the indoctrination not only the isolation but the indoctrination these young men were to be taught to think like the Babylonians and to eat like the Babylonians and to live like the Babylonians notice how they are given Babylonian names in verse 7 this is significant they are given Babylonian names So how bad was that? Or how significant was it, these Babylonian names? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Belteshazzar. Well, Daniel is a name that means my God is judge. Belteshazzar, which he would be named, is this, may Bel protect his life. Hananiah means God is gracious. Shadrach means the command of Aku, that is, the moon, their moon god. Mishael means who is what God is. Meshach means who is what Aku is. Azariah means God has helped, but Abednego means servant of Nebo, the Babylonian god. Brainwashing, you see, can have subtle twists to them particularly affecting the youth drawn into a certain culture, a pop culture, we might call it. A former minister of mine said in 1960s, and I, I heard this with my own ears, I heard this, he said this, a whole generation has been captivated. And this was in 1960s, okay? This was before the worst effects of the mid-60s 
and the sort of things for which we're smarting now, like uh, the Abortion Act and the decriminalization of homosexual activity and so on. A whole generation has been captivated. We have been victims. We have been victims of a gigantic, gigantic takeover bid that has covered the whole of life and whose effects are going to be far more shattering yet than have been so far seen. What a malign influence the media and education system can have when they come under the sway of anti-biblical thought. And it's happened to us over these years. The education system has become, has become a source, an impetus for secularizing. It's like a machine. The education system is like a machine for producing little secular people who are going to conform to the social and cultural and sexual mores of the pit, basically. The names allocated to these, these young men reminds us of how after the atheistic Russian revolution of 1917, the name of Petrograd was changed to Leningrad. But consistently with the recovery of the Orthodox Church after the, the, the fall of the, of the, the, the Soviet, Soviet Union in 1991, it was renamed St. Petersburg. I haven't had the same thing in Scotland because in my younger days in Edinburgh, there were a flight of steps from Prince's Street up to the mound, the top of the mound. And it was called John Knox Steps. John Knox Steps, of course, after the reformer. But somebody changed, decided it wasn't quite a good idea because he was sectarian and he was strict and so on. We don't want to think about, you see, this is the whole thing about not wanting to think about our history. Just do away with our history somehow. So John Knox Steps was replaced with Playfair Steps. Playfair Steps, who knows who Playfair was? Playfair was an architect who built, who, who, who designed some of, the, some of the buildings at the top of the mound. But he was, he, he was apparently to be seen as more significant than John Knox. And there was no squeak from the church. Just happened. Just happened. And the statue of John Knox outside St. Paul's, St. 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 John's Cathedral was put inside because they thought it might be subject to damage. That was the idea. But it's the idea of suppressing the history of the nation. This is the battle for the mind, you see. And these young men were facing it. And the young people here today are facing it in our society. They're going to be set, a, set afloat on, on a society which is going to secularize them at every point unless they are well taught like these boys here, like these children, young people here. So let our minds be stayed upon the Lord. Let them be directed by Christ speaking through his word. Let us be unbending in this. Let us be discerning of what bombards us in this alien, secular climate and world in which we live, and which is a spiritually dangerous one in these dull days spiritually. And in this a real sense in which it is over to us, we are living in this, and therefore we will not do so. We will not do so without raising our voices and our hearts to the Lord, that he would deliver us, that he would make us courageous like these young men were seen to be. But there's another aspect of this, and that is the compromise that was encouraged. This is clearly another policy to integrate these men to an alien society, to an alien religious society, a religious culture, a pagan environment. How do we see this here? It's another devilish ploy. Little wonder the New Testament warns believers of the devil and his devices and his minions because they want to pull down Christians and they want to pull down the Christian church. They can never defeat Christ, of course. Christ is not defeatable, not, 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 never going to be brought down. Christ is king. Christ has the victory. His side is the side of victory. 
So Christ cannot be defeated. Satan is defeated ultimately. But meantime, meantime, churches can be ruined. The pressure on Daniel and his friends can be seen in verse 5. The king appointed a daily provision of the king's meat and of wine, wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end of thereof they might stand before the king. But Daniel, verse 8, purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which they, he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Well, these, what, what did this involve? How Did this involve compromise for them? The appointment of the daily portion, how does that involve compromise? Well, these young men following the Old Testament revelation they had, especially the first five books of, the, of Moses, the first five books of the, New, of the Old Testament, knew to give no place to idolatry. Now, there are two ways of perhaps understanding this. One is that they were being asked to, to use things which were defiled foods, maybe to do with blood, for example. But in any case, they were going to be led by, by their understanding of what was required by the word of God, by the law of God. And they were not going to give any place to idolatry. In that Babylonian society, thanks were given to their deities or false gods for food. Partaking would seem to acknowledge, that, acknowledge such gods. And that is why Daniel purposed in his heart that he should not defile himself with the king's meat. It's interesting that this is an issue in the New Testament as well. A decree was sent out from the church to abstain from things of, of, offered to idols in Acts 15 and verse 29. Was that a small thing? Maybe it is a small thing. And maybe the th th it seems to be a small thing there in Babylonia as well. But the believer is to be careful of small things. The believer is to be careful of anything that is an offense to God and that is a breaking of his law. To be sensitive to these things, as these young men were. And there was obviously a, a, a compromise encouraged here, given that we have, we have this tone throughout the book of Daniel. Various incidents in the book of Daniel showed that they were prepared not to be compromising because they felt that this was compromising with idolatry, compromising with, with infractions of the law of God. We have it uh, in the incident uh, of the statue of, that was set up for Nebuchadnezzar and the fiery furnace incident. We have it in the incident with reference to the, um, with reference to the, the, the lion's den uh, with, with Daniel and so on. They weren't prepared they weren't prepared to compromise. They must obey God rather than men, just as in the New Testament. The, the apostles' attitude was exactly the same. They were told not to speak in the name of Jesus. I mean, this is something that is very fresh in our society. Open-air preaching, for, for instance. There's, there's a sense in which you can see that people are going to be told not to... Not to Speak in the name of Jesus. This is something that will encourage some sort of hate, supposedly. Or as an offence to Muslims or some others that are passing by who might take offence at it. And so what, what, what were they going to do? Were they going to just collapse, collapse and, 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 and yield to this? No. We will obey God rather than men. And so they went on doing what they did in spreading the name and purpose and teaching and doctrine and claims of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as here, Daniel, for instance, was going to continue to pray three times a day and the Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego 
these three, they were not going to bow to the statue of um, Nebuchadnezzar that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So we have to be aware of covetousness. We have to be aware of compromise. We have to be aware of attachment to merely material things. In his temptations, Jesus is taken to a mountaintop by the devil to survey the kingdoms of this world. They, were, they would all be his if he just worship Satan. The answer, get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Anything to draw one away from loyalty to the Lord is something that is to be resisted steadfastly. That was a subtle temptation, a temptation to compromise. We must close. So beware, my dear friends, of devices to loosen attachment to the Lord and his word and his church and his day and everything that is his. Beware giving place to ungodly thoughts and traits. Beware exposure to prevailing perversity and godless ideas. So what do we do? We exercise ourselves with diligence in being discerning at what you see and what you hear and developing in your thinking a worldview that is based upon the scriptures of the Old and New Testament and the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ as the central figure of it all and the Saviour who has claims upon all of us of our loyalty and love in our hearts. How diligent we, we must be with our Bibles and not compromise truth and godliness. How watchful we must be with all the influences that press upon us day by day from the world and from the flesh and the devil. How watchful we must be. How vital to have a close walk with Christ our Saviour, as Saviour and Lord, without compromise, as our friend and guide in this wicked and perverse generation in which it has pleased the Lord that we should live through. And we should live through as we have any love for the Lord Jesus Christ with steadfast love for him and consistency with his holy word. And may the Lord enable us to be those who are indeed uncompromising, those who are indeed those who, who are salt in the earth and light in the world. And may the Lord bless these thoughts upon his holy word. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for Christ, for such a saviour, and we pray that our supreme loyalty would be to him, to his word, to his claims, to his law, to his teaching, to himself, to himself as the risen, ascended saviour, coming again saviour. Oh, we pray, Lord, that thou wouldst help us to be consistent Help us to be godly in this present world. Help us to resist and eschew evil and sin and to live for righteousness and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Look upon us then in mercy. Cleanse us from sin. Give us thy blessing tonight, today. Continue with us, we pray thee, to do us good and to bless us in our souls and undertake for us forgiving sin in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us sing in conclusion in Psalm number 4 and verses 1 to 5. Psalm 4, verses 1 to 5. Give ear unto me when I call, God of my righteousness. Have mercy, hear my prayer, thou hast enlarged me in distress. O ye the sons of men, how long will ye love vanities? How long my glory turn to shame, and will ye follow lies? But know that for himself the Lord, the godly man doth choose. The Lord, when I on him do call, to hear will not refuse. Fear and sin not. Talk with your heart on bed and silent be. Offerings present ye of righteousness, and in the Lord trust ye. 
singing these verses from Psalm 4 to the praise of the Lord. Give ear to me unto me when I call. of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>